My name is Uta Poiger and I am the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities here at Northeastern and it is good to see so many members of our community and also guests here this morning for our annual Northeastern Holocaust commemoration. This event, as you know, is a key element in our Holocaust Awareness Week. Each year the events of the week are presented by the Northeastern Humanities Center in conjunction with the Holocaust Awareness Committee. And I want to thank the members of the Holocaust Awareness Committee and especially its chair, Laurel Leff, for bringing us important and thought-provoking programs. Right now, it is my pleasure to hand the microphone over to Northeastern's President, Joseph Aoun. Uh, President Aoun is unfortunately not able to stay here for very long because of the demands of the snowstorm and um, various situations. He's able to give his welcome remarks and then he will have to leave us uh, very soon. But thank you very much for being here today, President Aoun. Good morning, good morning everyone. And Judge, welcome back. How was Mississippi? Great. Uh, we're glad to have you back. And uh, let me first start by saying that the, we have a facilities team and staff and the public safety and uh, the w people who were working in uh, food services that were here essentially uh, for three days nonstop working. And the fact that we take for granted that we can come to campus is frankly due to this enormous work that uh, they have done. So if you see them, please thank them. This is quite uh, an achievement. And uh, you know, you know that Madeline is here. She and uh, the, the, our students also benefited from that. So without further ado, let me mention why I, I wanted to be here at the beginning and unfortunately as I, I have to go. Every year when we meet, we talk about uh, the Holocaust and we talk about preventing uh, genocides, Holocaust uh, all over the world. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we saw that recent events are uh, making this uh, uh, awareness more important than ever, whether it's uh, in the nation or whether it's in the globe. You know, till now people are killed because uh, they are uh, Jews or people are killed because of their religion and this is totally unacceptable. In some parts of the world, anti-Semitism is on the rise and we cannot accept that. It's as simple as that. So, you know, the, 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 the breakfast is part of something much larger, as Uta said. And what is, you know, the goal is very simple. You know, whether you are a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian or a black, it is unacceptable and that you are targeted because of your religion, because of your, the, your color. We still have a long way to go. And the efforts and the work and the engagement is to this end. Unfortunately, we faced a setback this year in the world. And it's up to each one of us beyond this week, beyond everything we do, not to accept it and to work hard, even on campus. You know we had an incident. And you know that other campuses had this incident simply unacceptable. We cannot afford any, any incident that is showing rejection, anti-Semitism, racism. So let's continue to work together. More than ever, this week has to become an opportunity to send a message throughout the year, and not only here at Northeastern, but throughout the nation, throughout the world. So thank you for doing that. And I, I hopefully, in the future, we can come back together, have another breakfast, and celebrate 
the disappearance of anti-Semitism and racism and intolerance and injustice still have a long way to go. Thank you. Well, as you just heard, and I think we are also very aware of this, um, President Aoun has repeatedly urged us, and I think in a sense he said that this morning as well, that on campuses we have to be uh, more than, um, than anywhere else really in many places. We have to be really models um, for society. We have to be models for how one can be a responsible citizen, um, how one can think responsibly, but also act responsibly in the face of racism and anti-Semitism. And indeed this year has brought all too many um, unfortunate events in different parts of the world in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, and elsewhere um, already. The Holocaust commemoration, as you know, has a long history at Northeastern, and it's an important part of our um, year-round efforts at what we call civic um, sustainability. The historian Norman Neymark has said that the Holocaust has become the dominant metaf historical metaphor of our time, and that is in some ways comforting and in other ways also daunting. And as we just reminded ourselves, of course, even as we see the Holocaust as such an important event, we still have Holocaust deniers and we still have anti-Semitism so prominent uh, in the world. The author Daniel Mendelssohn, who spoke at Northeastern two years ago, has raised another important and provocative question. He has asked whether the injunction to never forget puts us at risk of forgetting individual stories as they are shaped into large manageable parables that cultures need to live by. The, spirits of the spirit of the events that our Holocaust Awareness Committee has put together is very much one of not going by simple parables, but rather of acknowledging acknowledging individual stories, individual trauma, and also acknowledging the difficult and often messy questions that the Holocaust raises. Questions about the breakdown of relations between neighbors that are part of the enactment of the Holocaust and that also characterize other genocides, and of course that wor worry us as well in the context of events such as the attacks in Paris. Questions about the responsibilities of bystanders, questions about the responsibilities of those who were not not under Nazi occupation, questions about the difficulties of resistance, questions about how to come to terms with trauma. As in other years, our gathering this morning features reflections from members of our Northeastern community. This year's Gideon Klein scholar, Elijah Botkin, and also a faculty member, Phil Brown. And we can be sure that each will integrate individual stories of suffering with larger questions. And what is particularly remarkable about them is also that they are capable and will show us different modes um, of artistic engagement as well as intellectual engagement with the important questions that the Holocaust continues to raise. So let's all give uh, a hand to the Holocaust Awareness Committee and for the, to the important work that it's doing under the leadership of Laurel Leff. And it is then my pleasure to introduce Lori Lefkowitz, who is the director of the Northeastern Humanities Center. She is also the Rudiman Professor of Jewish Studies here at the university, as well as the director of Jewish Studies. Thank, Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Uta. Thank you all for coming out on a cold and snowy morning and in this way acknowledging the importance of what we're doing here. Um, thanks to Northeastern uh, Professor Bill Giesen, um, who in his lifetime established the Gideon Klein Prize in 1997 to memorialize his mother, Gustel Korman Giesen. For almost 15 years, a talented student has undertaken a substantial project about some aspect of the arts and the Holocaust. Um, Uta talked about the importance of particular, remembering particular stories and particular people, and Gideon Klein was such a person. Um, our students in this way are encouraged to carry forward the legacy of Gideon Klein, who had been a brilliant composer and pianist, and during his imprisonment in Terezin, inspired young composers, almost all of whom, like Gideon Klein himself, came to premature deaths in Auschwitz. 
our students embody the promise of young artists in whom today we place our own hopes for an enlightened future. And Elijah Botkin, the undergraduate from whom we will hear today, is an exemplary student. Working under the direction of Professor Joshua Jacobson, he used this scholarship to learn and to write, honoring the children who died by studying the words they left behind and giving new and renewed expression to their art. Elijah, a senior who majors in math and music, directs the Prosdor Choir at Hebrew College and the Northeastern University Madrigal Singers. He sings with the Zamir Chorale and serves as president and bass section leader for the NU Choral Society. I'm very proud of Elijah, who served with de dedication on this year's Holocaust Awareness Committee and undertook this project with energy and devotion. He has a bright future, and we should all look forward to it. Elijah. I'm going to begin with a story taken from Joseph Karas's Music in Terrorism. On a dismal day, October 16, 1944, a freight train moved lazily from Terrazin to an unknown destination somewhere in the east. Perhaps the sun was shining brightly, but it was dismal inside the cattle car filled with a strange cargo. This was a normal sort of day, especially in the few weeks between September 28th and October 28th of that year, with a number of similar trains headed in the same direction, always with the same purpose, to transport thousands of prisoners from the anteroom to hell to the real hell in Auschwitz. Thousands upon thousands of people whose only crime was that they were born of Jewish parents. Suddenly a piece of paper appeared in the air alongside the train, gliding to the ground. A postcard with a terse message had been dropped from the cattle car with the hope that some bystander would put a stamp on it and mail it. And somebody did. A few days later, the postcard reached its destination. It expressed concern about several people. Dear Alinka, it reads, Sophie Fisher has promised me today that she will visit our mother frequently. All of us think today very much of Lewis and Clarka. Be well, let the dear God protect you, love and kisses, Egon. There was no concern expressed about the sender himself, Egon Ledich, the former assistant concertmaster to the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra, a fine artist and equally fine person. Always worried about others and lent a helping hand whenever possible. For, three, for almost three years, the sound of his beloved violin poured like a healing balm into the hearts of his fellows in misery, and only a few days earlier, he had participated in the world premiere of a composition written for the Terrorism Orchestra. Today, the composer, the conductor, and many members of the ensemble, together with hundreds of yesterday's audiences, were on their way to the fearsome unknown. On a little postcard, Egon Ledich wrote his own most, f uh, his own most fitting epitaph the last sentence of the last chapter of his story. There were only a few more words to be added, but, he could not, but that he could not do personally. The next day, in Auschwitz, he was led from the station platform directly into the gas chamber. From the time it opened in 1941 through the end of the war in 1945, about 140,000 people passed through Terrazin. Of those, about 20,000 were children, and only about 1,000 of those survived. Terrazin is well known for its cultural activity during those four years. Me when, uh, many well-known musicians, artists, writers, scientists, and poets were imprisoned there, and they all helped contribute to the rich cultural life that developed. In addition, the Nazis used Terrazin as a source of propaganda. In 1944, under pressure from the Danish government, they allowed the International Red Cross to inspect Terrazin. In the weeks leading up to the inspection, the camp was beautified by the so-called residents in an attempt to hide the true nature of the camp from the rest of the world. It was portrayed in Nazi propaganda as a spa town where elderly German Jews could retire in safety. During the inspection, the Red Cross was treated to a performance of the children's opera, Brundebar, performed by the children at the camp. The children in Terrazin also wrote stories, drew and painted pictures, and wrote poetry. Some of these works were saved from the war and were published by Hannah Volovkova in 1994 in a collection called I Never Saw Another Butterfly. For my project as this year's Gideon Klein Scholar, I chose one of the poems written by a child in Terrazin and set the words to music for chorus, string quartet, and chimes. Uh, and now I will do a short performance of it. Go to the next one. 
sorry, ah, before you go on. Uh, this artwork was drawn by Anna Rose Scherneman as the cover for the printed version that I will be printing for the Northeastern University Choral Society when we sing it in a couple weeks. If you can go to the next one, and up at the top. So many marches been drummed here. Why so many soldiers? Why have so many marches been drummed here? Why so many soldiers?
Thank you. The poem I chose is called The Closed Town by an unknown author. My first thought was to try to find the original, uh, the original manuscript and write my piece in Czech, uh, but realizing that I would have to learn to read, pronounce, and then teach 32 other singers how to read and pronounce Czech, I cited, decided that was a little bit too ambitious for me. Creating this piece of music was challenging for me. Most of my prior experience comes from arranging music, which is essentially notating a cover of an already existing song. Creating something from scratch was a whole new experience. It usually takes me about three days to write an arrangement. I spend some time listening to the original song. Uh, I spend a little bit of time figuring out how each section is going to sound, and then finally I write it all down. Writing an original score of this length with this many parts was a new and extraordinarily, and an, sorry, was a new and extraordinary learning experience for me. The piece took me approximately six months to write, but only about five hours of actual music notation. I spent countless hours sitting with a piece of paper in front of me with absolutely no idea what to write down. The beginning was by far the most difficult. I tried about four or five different iterations uh, of different beginnings before finding one that I was happy with. And then it took another few weeks before I got another idea for how to continue. You see the pattern. But once I made it past those beginning stages, the music came surprisingly naturally. Not having written for strings before, I got help from Professor Jacobson as well as a local violinist with phrasing and making sure that what I wrote was actually playable. I'm very happy with what I created and I'm most excited to see it come to life at the end of this semester. On April 18th, I will be conducting The Closed Town with the Northeastern University Chamber, Ense uh, Chamber Ensemble as part of the Northeastern University Choral Society's Spring Concert. And I certainly hope that uh, some of you will be able to attend. I would like to thank you all for coming to listen to me uh, speak this morning, uh, as well as Lori Lefkowitz for helping me with my project uh, and my speech, and Professor Josh Jacobson, who unfortunately could not be here today, uh, but thanks to him for all his help coaching me in composition, conducting, uh, and for overall just being a great mentor to me for the past two years. I would also like to thank Amy Lieberman and the Northeastern University Choral Society uh, for giving me the opportunity con to conduct my own piece at our upcoming concert. Uh, thank you again. Wow. <laughs> so it's all about um, memorializing the past, but also about looking forward to the future. And um, I, I feel hopeful. Um, this year's theme, in fact, for, for the Holocaust Awareness Week is the legacy of the Holocaust, um, which is about the relationship between the past and the future, and I think um, our next speaker uh, will address that in, in a very particular way. Um, you don't get to be a university distinguished professor, and in this case, university distinguished professor of sociology and health sciences, and director of the Social Science Environmental Health Research Institute, which an institute that conducts uh, transdisciplinary research at the boundaries of social science and environmental health without being a renowned, accomplished scientist and sociologist as Phil Brown, Professor Phil Brown is. Um, but there are some brilliant, accomplished people um, who are equally famous in a secondary area of research that is a hobby, a labor of love. Uh, for Phil Brown, that area is the Catskills. And I just can't get enough of hearing about it, I have to tell you. For, it's really, it's personal for me. Um, in 1948, my father came to the United States uh, after three years of wandering around Europe, having been liberated 70 years ago from Buchenwald and having suffered immeasurable losses. That same year, 1948, when my mother was 15, she arrived in New York City after a long exile and a childhood spent in Siberia and three years in Ulm. By the time I was born, a, a DP camp in old, displaced persons camp, by the time I was born, less than a decade later, 
We spent um, one week every summer in the Catskills, graduating from the humble Marty's Bungalow Colony to the Falls View and the Stevensville, and even ultimately the Concord. <laughs> I have fond memories of uh, driving early on Tuesday mornings, which was my father's day off, up to the Nevisink River in the Catskills where we would go fishing. What I learned from my colleague, Phil Brown, is that these happy details of my own childhood were part of a phenomenon of Holocaust survivors embracing new life. Um, Phil Brown, I'm just gonna tell you his, cat, his uh, Catskill credentials. He is founder and president of the Catskills Institute, an organization that works to record and remember the history of the Cat Catskills through conferences, public speaking, support of scholarly research, and collecting materials for the world's largest archive of Catskill items. I have to give him some pictures. <laughs> He's author of Catskill Culture, A Mountain Rat's Memory of Memories of the Great Jewish Resort Area, um, editor of In the Catskills, A Century of the Jewish Experience in the Mountains, that's what we call them, co-editor with Holly Levitsky of Summer Haven, the, the Catskills, the Holocaust, and the Literary Imagination, which, will be which is forthcoming this May. The Jewish Book Council selected Phil Brown as one of their authors for a national tour in fall 2002. He has twice taught at Klez Camp, the annual festival of klezmer music and Yiddish culture run by living traditions. I love that phrase. It, it, it tells the whole story of what we're about. Um, Brown is a member of the Boston uh, Workmen's Circle, where he organizes the high holiday services and organizes the music for the services. He's a member of the Klezmer Band, to Klez for comfort. <laughs> um, and uh, very importantly for me, he's a new member of the Jewish Studies Executive Committee. Um, welcome, Phil. Thank you. <laughs> We are kings of the was a constant favorite in the Catskills, a song beginning in the woe of living in Nazi Europe and the hope for a new life in the promised land. Whether in the modest casinos, which were the entertainment halls, not gambling casinos, of small hotels, or the nightclubs of larger ones, singers of all levels of fame pounded this one out in Yiddish and English. The song ends with a promise fulfilled, the post-Holocaust Yishuv, to become Israel in 1948. That was where they could go. For at last I am free, no more. 
They wandered not only to Israel but to America. The year after the war ended, 1946, Holocaust survivors began to arrive here from displaced persons camp while GIs returned from extended tours in occupied Europe. Some settled into jobs in the Catskills. Indeed, the first person I interviewed for my book, Catskill Culture, was sent to work in the Flagler Hotel by Hyas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. That same year, European Jews and Mizrahi Jews from the Middle East began to flee to the Yishuv, where they would establish the State of Israel two years later. At the same time, Hashamir Hatzair, the youth guard, had a Camp Shomriya and other labor Zionist camps and socialist camps were set up all throughout the Catskills to prepare Jews for Aliyah to Israel. The year 1946 was also significant because Jews began to vacation without guilt in the mountains, opening the floodgates of the golden era of the 1950s and 60s when over a thousand hotels and bungalow colonies operated in what was then the world's largest resort area with an estimated half million people going there every year. 1946 was also the year that my parents bought the Royal Hotel in White Lake. The hotel would be foreclosed upon in only six years, and they and I would work in other people's hotels all their lives, and all of mine until graduate school. The longest duration job for my mother, a chef, was six years up till that time at the Seven Gables Hotel in Greenfield Park, and that was where I learned about the Holocaust. Leon Uris's Exodus told the same story as the song we opened with, and its 1958 publication when I was nine left the whole hotel population talking about the book as they shared the few copies available. <coughs> that kind of Catskills context was my primary Jewish education. I should say a few words about the history of the Catskills, which began with the farmlands of mainly Ulster and Sullivan counties. The year-round population of chicken and dairy farmers had a hard time making a living on the poor soil there and began taking in borders. Eventually, many made that their main enterprise. Some boarding homes became kuchelains, cook for yourself, a room rented in a boarding house in which kitchen and dining room were shared. These facilities held 10 to 40 guests. Kuchelains frequently became bungalow colonies in which individual cottages had their own kitchens and a couple of rooms. Some later turned into hotels, though many hotels would start directly from farms or just as hotels. These were a familial milieu. People knew each other the entire summer, forming very close ties. In the hotels, owners, guests, and staff often knew each other, often coming from the same city neighborhood, and hotels acquired a local culture that continued into the rest of the year. Guests returned year after year, and often from generation to generation. A child in the day camp might later be a waiter and return once again as a guest with children, and staff guest romances were historically very common. Some hotels in Bungalow colonies were very thoroughly Yiddishist, even to the 60s. The best known was Greenefelder, Greenfields, a literary colony in Woodridge where Isaac Bashev, a singer, among other famous writers and artists, stayed. And the persistence, actually, of Yiddish speaking and of the Yiddish-English patois so frequently heard in these resorts was actually a form of resistance against the Nazi destruction of that people and language. My editor, Holly Levitsky, and I put together Summer Haven, The Catskills, The Holocaust, and The Literary Imagination to explore both old and new writings and recollections of people who wrote before. We explore how vacationers, resort owners, workers, and local residents dealt with the horrific contradiction, that pleasure of the Summer Haven and the mass extermination of Jews across the ocean. We took the opportunity to conduct more original research on the Holocaust and the immediate after period in the Catskills, and we asked each author or surviving relative to reflect on their writings. The Catskills were a summer haven for both survivors and those who had arrived earlier. Jews sought ways to release their rising fears and ongoing anxieties during and after the war by engaging in community life while living beside the disaster. The social climate of the Catskills did introduce a lighter side, an abundance of pleasures in the form of food, sex, music, dancing, and humor. 
and the words and feelings of people there convey a longing to recapture the pre-Holocaust past and an incapacity really to measure the immense loss of, loss of the Holocaust. But they could laugh and cry simultaneously, an understanding of the human need for love and connection even after such full-scale loss. I was driven to this project because I always thought of a lot about the Catskills experience in the Holocaust and after period. But there were two main phenomena that propelled me. I was involved in the advisory board for the film Four Seasons Lodge, a beautiful documentary of a bungalow colony collectively owned and run by survivors. And I will say more about this shortly, and I hope you will all come later today at 2 o'clock to watch the beautiful film Four Seasons Lodge and to hear from its producer, Matt Levine. The second factor was a deep appreciation of Reuben Wallenrod's novel, Dusk in the Catskills, which I read when I began my Catskills research in 1993. Other Catskills authors who I'll talk about dealt with the Holocaust, but nobody like Wallenrod could portray this in such an unparalleled way. But let's try and figure out what were people doing during that time while the horrors were going on. At Grossinger's in 1939, people were entertained by Willie the Lion Smith and Fat Lips Page. At Tempo Cottages, a young man prepared to leave for war. In 1941, the Zausner family gathered in front of the handball courts at their Nemerson Hotel in South Fallsburg. In 1943, guests enjoyed themselves at the Wellworth Hotel in Hurleyville. We don't know exactly what they were thinking about in terms of the Holocaust, but the entertainers were conscious, as were other Jews, of what was happening. Their acts often included jokes about the war. And as the writer Jake Ehrenreich points out, survivors cried at home and laughed in the Catskills. But unlike at other hotels, Wallenrod clearly had the Holocaust centrally in his mind while he had a wartime stint as a writer in residence at this hotel in Glen Wild later renamed the Coronet, and further on, the Empress. Names are important from generation to generation. Beshert, by faith, the village of Glen Wild, Rosenblatt's locations, linked to the very beginning of Jewish Catskills history. The first Jewish resort was started there in 1899 by John Gerson, whose granddaughter, Sylvia Ader, I actually was fortunate to interview. Gerson provided land for the Glen Wild Synagogue in 1912, and it was built in 1923. Gerson had to know Louis Rosenblatt, whose hotel hosted Wallenrod, because Rosenblatt was indeed a charter member of this congregation. When I interviewed Abe and Dave Jaffe in 1993, they spoke about how proud they were to have had two Torahs in their house for services for 10 years until the Glen Wild Shul was built across the road from them. And they still treasured the Shul's huge ledger-sized minute book that they kept in their house. Abe's daughter, Naomi Jaffe, still owns that farm that her grandfather bought in 1919, 15 years after arriving in Glen Wild in 1904, and she thinks some of their property is actually on the site of Gerson's boarding home. She gave me this 1944 photo of the Glen Wild honor roll plaque of the Glen Wild GIs who served to fight fascism, and there it is with the Glen Wild Women's Club on the front lawn of Rosenblatt's hotel, clearly visible in the background, and that links the GI sacrifice to fight Nazism with the historical importance of the hotel. Wollenrod's eloquent juxtaposition of genocide and pleasure made for a jarring yet necessary understanding. But more than that, Wollenrod told his story over the entire season of the Rosenblatt Hotel, from pre-season preparation to post-season closing. In the process, he recorded the life not just of a hotel, but of a people. Written in Hebrew between 1941 and 1944, and first published in 1946 as Kifana Yom, literally, because the day turns, it was translated by the author into English and published by the Reconstructionist Press in 1957. Wollenrod, who left Belarusia for Israel in 1920 and came to the US three years later, was part of a group of writers known as the Hebrew Hebraist, or the Jewish nationalist. He was an accomplished novelist and literary critic with a number of books published and many studies of Jewish literature and Hebrew literature in particular. Dusk follows hotel owner Leo Halper over the course of one full year from the end of a summer season to the following autumn. During this period, the U.S. has entered the war in Europe. Halper, like Wollenrod, a Jewish immigrant from Eastern Europe, 
it feels painfully and acutely aware of the atrocities happening and at the same time remembers, enjoys his little Brookville Hotel and the beauty of the landscape. And the book is prophetic in its mixing of past, present, and future tenses to unfold the terrible story of the destruction of European Jewry. Wallenrod provides a clue to his prophetic role in the opening epigraph from Jeremiah. Woe unto us, for the day declineth, for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. Interestingly, the epigraph only exists in the English version written after the war and seems to send a warning back in time. The idea of warning one's flock is a leading feature of Wallenrod's mission to his people and his nation and the surrounding world. Dusk in the Caskills then stands with Jeremiah as the prophet's lamentation for the suffering of his people. As a small hotel owner, Halper has many bills to pay and fewer and fewer visitors to his little hotel, which he fears he may lose. In conversations with his wife and family, he worries that the world of the Jewish Catskills is fading and that the many immigrant writers and artists who depend upon him each summer season will lose that continuity. But the larger worry that grows within him, hidden from the others, is the Holocaust, the horrifying details about which he comes to know more and more during the course of the novel. He obsesses over the destruction of Jewry. He feels existentially connected and is roused to an almost feverish state of anxiety over his helplessness. He remembers fondly his years in a setting not unlike the Catskills, remembers himself as a boy running in the fields and swimming in the ponds of the old country where many of his relatives remain. And he muses during those memories about those people dancing in the casino. The heart knows well that there is another great, wide, threatening world outside you, but you are afraid to stop your dancing and think of that world. Such knowledge may well break up the charm of the circle. It may well break up your being, all of you. Halper refers both to the others and to himself with the pronoun you, carrying the tone of either a sermon or a rabbinical blessing or command. And like the leader of a congregation, Halper bears responsibility for his people and believes that they may not know what is best or how to act or how to see the deeper catastrophe of the Holocaust. Among his greatest concerns is what to do with that knowledge. He donates to the Jewish National Fund and other sources to help the new Israeli refugees and resettlement in his inner monologues, he struggles with a feeling of satisfaction in being amidst the lake of the mountains. But as soon as he feels grateful to have escaped the bleakness and death, fear and torture, he also feels shame for being safe at the Brookville. He is frustrated at not being able to help his family and friends in Europe. And as Warren Rudd writes, he was gnawed by the thought that he and Lillian were hiding here between the mountains in a sheltered den. There, across the mountains, terrible things were going on. People were being driven with whips in the cold and wind. Little children stood helplessly on the side of the road like forsaken sheep. And near them and from above them came fearful shrieks from the storm. And he, Leo Halper, was hiding here between the walls of his house in the Catskill Mountains. It was awesome and shamefully pleasant in the shelter. Halper's experiences are further captured in these words. People hid behind frost-colored windows, warmed their hands on iron stoves and listened to the sounds coming from the radio. The sounds seemed to come in the storm. The window panes trembled, the trees hummed, the voices on the radio told of terrible storms across the mountains and the oceans. There, people fled in terror, hid in snow pits. Men and women left the houses in which they had lived all their lives and ran like frightened animals. There, across the mountains and the oceans, wild beasts laughed and mocked and threatened. And here, a man sat and listened to the radio. Will and Rod lost his father, sister, and her two children in the Holocaust. His book honors their memory even as it closely examines through the loneliness of Leo Halper, the terrible crisis of being removed from one's family as they face their death. Though tortured by an inability to act, his memories became a blessing, a monument to those people and places. Leo's thoughts are private memory, but the book is shared in public and openly expresses sorrow and sympathy in its lamentation. No one tackled the subject as deeply as Wallenrod, but many writers have dealt with this period, and they wrote on themes of nostalgia, loss, humor, and sexuality. 
I.B. Singer's novel, 1972, Enemies, a love story, has considerable time in the Catskills and addresses the incapacity to imagine the extent of the Holocaust. We learn about the impossibility of life returning to normal for the survivors. And yet, even with knowledge of such loss, and in the face of fractured lives, there is humor, love, sexuality, and always the search for a haven from that knowledge. Harvey Jacobs' 1975 novel, Summer on a Mountain of Spices, is even more focused on sexuality as it romps through the lives of the owners and guests at a small family hotel during the final two weeks of the war. The characters' longings and desires are played out amidst an abundance of sex and humor as a haven against the war, and the lustiness and earthiness of the landscape builds to an enormous celebration on the day the war ends. In Martin Boris's novel, Woodridge, 1946, it is more the returning GIs than the survivors who struggle to find their place after the horrors of war. Eileen Pollock's novel, Paradise, New York, reminds us that each hotel, even into the 60s, had people with numbers on their arms to which the hotel gave discounts out of compassion. And central to her book is the notion that the Catskills were a refuge for what was best about the culture Hitler tried to destroy exemplified in the dignity and the grace that people there have in their support for each other and in their building of community. <coughs> Art Spiegelman's mouse, too, spends much time in the Catskills with his father, Vladek, getting a calming distraction from the constant traumatic memories he carries like a second skin. Being in the Catskills gives him some level of autonomy over his increasingly chaotic life. Joe Berger's memoir, Displaced Persons, Growing Up American After the Holocaust, is a love story to his survivor parents. They experienced immeasurable loss working tirelessly after the war to recreate a home and family life. And while he chronicles their immense loss suffered there, he also honors the refuge in the Catskills that offered an opportunity for him and others to make new lives for themselves and their children. Thane Rosenbaum's short story, Bingo by the Bungalow, is also a haven, but seems more chaotic. Rosen Rosenbaum shows us cones where, quote, an entire colony was filled with crazies. It was a summer loony bin of refugees from the fall in Europe, now resettled in America, spending the months of June through August in Sullivan County. Each a survivor from one camp or another, Bergen-Belsen, Meidenek, Treblinka, Auschwitz, they were safe here, well, uh, as safe as they would ever allow themselves to feel. And Cohn spits in Hitler's face with his colony's entrance sign, Cohn's Summer Colleges, Leisure Mach Frei. <laughs> so this brings us to the idea of a whole colony of survivors, the rebirth, not just the destruction, but the haven is rebirth. A number had shared summers with each other in different colonies. Cutlers in South Fallsburg, many others, but felt uncomfortable telling their stories to people who had not been in the camps themselves, who had not lost their families and their friends. And so by the 1970s, they were feeling uncomfortable, and they bought an old colony, the Excelsior, and turned it into a survivor-owned colony. And it's truly a fitting way to recycle a resort. It's a place where they had the freedom to lounge they had the freedom to pray. They had the ability for providing friendship. They could share snacks at night. They could dress well for the evening events and be able to enjoy a good night of entertainment. And this was, for them, a very, very powerful thing to dress up and enjoy each other. We were very, very happy in uh, 1990, I forget what year it was, our 13th annual History of the Catskills Conference, when director Andrew Jacobs came along with uh, two of the members of the colony who were leaders there and spoke at our History of the Catskills Conference. Um, we were very fortunate um, to see the rushes before the film was finally released. Having a place with land aplenty and freedom to live on it that was a long-standing Jewish dream, Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. And it was in the Jewish heart, liturgy, literature, and folk life for millennia. And there are parallels between the return to Israel and the move to the Catskills. The kibbutzniks would make the desert bloom and grow the food to support themselves and their whole society. 
Jewish farmers moving to the Catskills would try to do something similar, though not being as successful beyond milk and eggs, but they built a very strong Jewish-centered culture from the 1890s onward. It was their farmhouses that became the first small boarding houses. And the resorts and villages with permanent residents were served by synagogues, Jewish schools, Jewish tradespeople and merchants, Jewish cultural institutions like the Workmen's Circle, the Jewish Agricultural Society, the Farmers Co-op and the Insurance Co-op. The Jews and the Catskills created their own sort of promised land, a place of safety. I wrote five short stories about the Catskills, one of which recounts the relationship between a distressed hotel owner and his unexpected guest, who ultimately shows him that the hotel, home, family is the Jerusalem of his heart. My intent was to relocate this realization in his heart, but in retrospect, I think the symbolism of return to Jerusalem is about the whole land of the Catskills. After masses of immigrants came between the 1890s and 1920s, and when the survivors came in the 1940s, they built in the United States the largest Jerusalem outside of Israel. They built their own mini Jerusalem in the Catskills. Like the whole golden Medina, the golden land of the United States, the Catskills would be a place where the Nazis could never threaten Jews again. No wonder there were Zionist training camps to prepare people for making Aliyah to Israel. The safety of the Catskills helped to shape the safety of the post-Holocaust state of Israel. As a child, teenager, and adult, I saw this vacation diaspora as an endless and timeless place, always to be there as an immense presence with joyful memories. To grow into adulthood and watch it disappear was a great loss, though that loss is what propelled me to become its chronicler. I quoted earlier Wallenrod's epigraph from Lamentations that sets the stage for his book. Woe unto us, for the day declineth, for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. For hotel keeper Leo Halper, this was the fear of the end of his hotel ownership and, writ large, the end of the Catskills, the latter which was not just ready to happen that early. We can look further to the threat of the end of the Jewish people and remember that Lamentations is Jeremiah's mourning poetry about the destruction of the temple. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How has she become as a widow? She that was great among the nations and princess among the provinces, how has she become tributary? She weepeth sore in the night and her tears are on her cheeks. She hath none to comfort her among all her lovers, all her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. After the temple is destroyed comes exile and always the age old hope for return. The Catskills is part of our repatriation. As I and others memorialize its legacy, photograph its ruins, collect its mementos and mine the memories of its players, we celebrate the summer haven we hope to always share. I rejoice in this return. Thank you, and again, thanks everyone for coming out on this cold and snowy day. Um, one of the challenges of commemorating the Holocaust is capturing uh, the scale of the catastrophe. And I was reminded of that when I was watching uh, Night Will Fall, which is a documentary that was on PBS this week, and it's a documentary about a documentary that was uh, made about the liberation of the camps. It's capturing the footage that was taken at the camps. And one little aside I'm going to make is that this is the um, first year that we decided to do this event um, in January and tie it to International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is the day of the liberation of Auschwitz. And there are some nice things about that, which is that um, there, we're not the only ones remembering. I mean, I, I feel like other years it's sort of we're doing Holocaust remembrance and nobody else is. And this year there were documentaries, there were news stories. Um, that, of course, is the nice thing. The not nice thing is that we got dumped with two feet of snow and had to cancel half of our programming. So like many things in Jewish life, it's a mixed blessing. Um, but as I was watching the, this documentary, I mean, one of the things that it does is, you know, and, and has to, right, is just there are so many bodies, right? Um, and it's horrifying, and you don't want to look anymore. But in order to sort of 
capture the, the experience, you have to have that. But you also have to have the realization that behind all of those bodies are stories and people and lives. And one of the things that for me was meaningful about today is that it provided an antidote to all of those bodies. Um, we got to learn the stories, right? So when Elijah spoke, he told us about a child whose name, unfortunately, we don't know, um, who wrote a poem in these horrible circumstances circumstances, and then Elijah, 70 years later, 75 years later, was able to write music to accompany those words. So we got that story. Um, and of course, Phil gave us lots of stories um, about people who were in the Catskills. And I think, you know, since I, I deal with America and the Holocaust, as Lori said, one of the things that was so moving to me is, you know, I deal with the news stories and all kind of the big things that are going on. But again, Phil was able to, through the use of the experiences in the hotels and the novels that were written about it, uh, get us, give us a sense of the anxiety of Americans, of people in America, whether they were the American Jews or they were the escapees from Europe, and the anxiety that they felt about what was happening in Europe, and then also the contradiction um, of being in these beautiful surroundings, having this lovely experience, and I think Phil was able to, to give that to us. So, you know, in a, along with the bodies, we also got the experiences, and, and I think that was so meaningful. Um, so, the way I want to just close um, is by thanking the committee. Um, all of us on the committee have the relatively easy task of deciding the programming and picking the speakers. Um, and this year in particular, it just, it, it seemed incredibly easy. I mean, if nothing else, we had Phil to give our um, faculty talk, which was terrific, and Elijah um, to do the, the music, and also he, as the grandson um, of survivors, he was also going to talk with his grandma, which we hope he will be able to do at a later date. So to everybody on the committee, Mac Abrams, Elijah Bodkin, uh, Rudy Breitler, Phil Brown, um, Lori Lefkovich, who you've heard from, Deborah Mandel, Jim Ross, Jenny Sartori, and Rosal Tejik, I really appreciate your experience. And those are the people on the, the committee who, you know, do the easy work, but there are other members of the committee who also do the hard work. Um, um, which is of making this happen. Um, and this year it was doubly, maybe triply hard, uh, meaning for Erica uh, Koss and for Megan Brewson and uh, for Perry Onapetti and Leslie Casey. Um, they not only had to do all of the work to make the uh, events happen this week, but then they had to do the work of canceling half of them, um, which was a work, and then they may have to do the additional work of trying to reschedule. So every year we appreciate what they do, but this year we appreciate it doubly and triply, um, and we also doubly and triply appreciate all of you coming today. So thank you very much.